Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stacy Garcia. I'm the cultural officer of the Philippine Embassy in London. And we would like to welcome you to one of our um, events marking the launch of Centro Rizal London. So welcome to the talk, Annotating Colonial Histories, Jose Rizal and the Rethinking of the Filipino Identity in 19th Century England. Uh, we have with us a very notable Philippine historian whom I will formally introduce uh, in a little bit. But for now, to welcome us formally to this event, please help me welcome the Ambassador of the Philippines to the Court of St. James, His Excellency Antonio Manuel Lagdameo. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Even at the height of what can safely be called the Philippine Enlightenment in the 19th century, Filipinos in those days knew very little about themselves except from the books and writings about the Philippine archipelago, which were solely written by Europeans. One book which was published in 1609 particularly caught the attention of nine-year-old Jose Rizal and became his reason many years later for crossing the Atlantic on board the SS city of Rome on a journey to Great Britain. Rizal was uh, deeply disturbed by what he read in Antonio de Morga's Sucesos de, los Islas, de los, las Islas Filipinas that he took great pains in copying the book word for word and adding annotations in order to correct entries that he believed uh, misrepresented the Philippines and Philippine culture. Among these included Morga's belief that Filipinos ate rotten food, when in fact, what he was referring to was what many Filipinos know today as bagoong or shrimp paste. Filipinos, Rizal was quick to point out, developed innovative ways to preserve food and to enhance its flavor in a tropical climate. Unfortunately, these methods were alien to the West. This exercise made Rizal realize many things about our history and culture, and his passion to correct these misimpressions was so evident that his work on sucesos is considered one of his greatest works. Even today, many decades after Rizal, the United Kingdom and Ireland still know very little about the Philippines, despite the increasing number of Filipinos who con continue to contribute greatly to British and Irish uh, societies. More interestingly, there are also many Filipinos, especially those who were born or raised here, who know very little about their grandparents' birthplace and the culture that shaped their ancestors. Tonight, the Embassy, the National Commission on Culture and the Arts, and the Philippine Studies Center of SOAS, University of London, is proud to mark the launch of Centro Rizal London. We hope that this cultural center will help Filipinos and British people alike to deepen their understanding of Philippine culture. And we think there is no better way to launch Centro Rizal than by a conversation with one of the Philippines' acclaimed historians and researchers, Dr. Jose Victor Torres. His talk, Annotating Colonial Histories, Jose Rizal and the Rethinking of, Rethinking of Filipino Identity in the 19th Century England, will walk us through how the concept of a truly national Filipino identity blossomed in one of the greatest Filipino minds. It is our hope that you will leave this hall asking more questions and eager to know more about the Philippines. Like Rizal, it is the challenge of every Filipino to share an accurate story of our history, our people, and our identity to the world. 
from all of us at the embassy, a welcome to you all. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Your Excellency. So it has been a dream of the Philippine Embassy in London and the Filipino community in the United Kingdom and Ireland for Centro Rizal London to finally be launched. Um, the main goal of Centro Rizal London is to become not just a repository of cultural materials about the Philippines, but to be an active center that re reconnects uh, the Filipino community to Filipino culture and to help spread the, the ideals, the thoughts, uh, the wisdom of great Filipinos to inspire not only Filipinos, but also um, British and Irish citizens. So without further ado, please let me introduce, please allow me to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, I met Vic very recently. Uh, Dr. Jose Victor Torres is uh, not just your typical historian. He has a very unique background merging journalism and uh, history, his specialization in history, which made it possible for him to write several works that make history appealing to the average everyday person, to the average everyday Filipino. And he has been one of the he has been one of one of the Philippine historians who has truly stoked the interest of the Filipino youth on items on things about Philippine history and Philippine culture. He is an award-winning playwright. He is an awardee of the prestigious Palanca Awards. And currently he is a full professor at De La Salle University, Manila. Um, ladies and gentlemen, guests, please help me welcome. Our guest lecturer for tonight, Dr. Jose Victor Torres. Uh, good evening. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll lecture sitting down. I've been enjoying the sights of London too much, and I can't walk wearing leather shoes, and uh, it's been painful. It's been an ordeal to walk. Uh, just a few things. It's my first time in London, and I really enjoy the city. It's actually also my first time to travel abroad. And um, i like to thank the Embassy and the National Culture for the Culture and the Arts, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, you know, for inviting me to lecture on a topic that actually has not been talked about too much because of the concentration of the works of Jose Rizal on the Noli and the Fili. No, the Noli Metangere and the El Filibusterismo. And, but what has been disregarded or forgotten by a lot of uh, people, especially uh, the students and researchers on Jose Rizal, is that the Morga, or the Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, is considered Rizal's second major work earlier than the El Filibusterismo. And he wrote it here in the city of London using a source that uh, was a very rare book no, that, was, that was not uh, found in the Philippines. It was actually found in the British, uh, used to be found in the British Museum Library, now in the British Library, of which um, I had the exciting moment of handling it this morning at the uh, British Library. So thank you, Stacy, for facilitating that uh, short uh, gift. No? The title of my lecture is Annotating Colonial Histories. Jose Rizal and the Rethinking of the Filipino Identity in 19th Century England. Rethinking because by the time Rizal already made the study of the Morga, we already had some idea. Of what, our, uh, of the Filipino, what the Filipino identity was. What Rizal introduced here was a unique idea of trying to interpret the Filipino identity. I'll start my paper. 130 years ago today, on May 25, 1888, a young Filipino who became a reluctant celebrity in his homeland arrived in the city of London. It had been four months 
since Jose Rizal left the Philippines upon the advice of family and friends following the decision by the Catholic Church and the Spanish colonial government to ban his novel, The Nolime Tangere. He had traveled to Hong Kong, he had traveled to Japan, he had traveled through the United States until finally arriving in England. He would spend 10 months in London, his first time in a city that saw the birth of the modern era of industry and politics. But unlike his other travels in Asia and Europe, Rizal did not visit London to observe and record its culture and daily life. He arrived to begin an endeavor that would be a first for him. He would attempt to write a history of his country. It resulted in the discovery of a book on the Philippines written by a Spanish official, Antonio de Morga, the Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, and the rethinking and the affirmation of the Filipino identity through the study of his country. In this lecture, I will, dis I will be discussing Jose Rizal, not just a historian, but as a reformist who saw history as a weapon against colonialism by establishing the recognition of a national identity. I will also discuss the context of Jose Rizal's London, where he spent 10 months in a city during a period what would be known in world history as Pax Britannica, where philosophy is born out of the Age of Enlightenment, centuries before, formed the basis of ideas for the Filipino reform movement in Spain. I will also include here how Rizal's historiography was part of a growing scholarship of a Europe of empires, one of which was the England of Queen Victoria. Rizal's London. What was surprising about Rizal was that he barely talked about London during his stay here. If you look at the collection of his letters, he seldom talked about uh, the city. His letters to friends and families about his visits to Japan and the United States were replete with observations and comments about the culture of these countries. He barely described London, except for a letter he wrote to his parents and siblings on June 12, 1888, two weeks after his arrival in London, where he mentioned the address where they could correspond with him. That was in 37 Chalcot Crescent, Primrose Hill, Northwest London, England as well as a brief description of the city when he arrived. You can see here the text of the description. The following day, the 25th, we left by the Midland Railway for London, and the road is very beautiful. The land is cultivated, neat and pretty houses and big factories. In the afternoon, we reached London, and we stopped at the Grand Hotel Midland. From there, I went to look for my letters, house, etc. At first, I lodged at the house in Beresford Road, but afterwards, I didn't like it, and after a week, came here to live with a private family. That house belonged to the Beckett family, and his two rooms were rented out to him for 45 pesos. What is notable in Rizal's statement is where he says in the same letter, in England, everything is expensive than in other parts of Europe. Rizal arrived on a Friday, thus when the weekend came, he found Sunday in London boring, as every place was closed. <laughs> Here is what he wrote. There are neither shops nor theaters, and if music is played, it is, it is only religious music. Hardly one can see a poor coach going through the streets. On Sunday afternoons, he had tea with the family of Dr. Reinhold Ross, director of the India Office Library in London, and what is called an Orientalist, as scholars who studied Asian history and culture were called. Rizal mentioned that Rust has a, had an impressive Filipiniano collection, which he allowed Rizal to use. So what was London when Rizal arrived in 1888? Here I must mention an amusing encounter in doing some internet research. You type London in 1888 on any search engine, and guess what? what the majority of entries will, that will come out. You want to know what it is? It's Jack the Ripper. No? All the entries, every time I would type London in 1888, Jack the Ripper would always come out. You could hardly see a description of the city. And I said, this is going to be quite ridiculous because it's, it's very, uh, quite a limited, um, limited uh, topic. So in order to avoid further 
talking about uh, one of the famous mass murderers in, in, our, in our history, you know, with, uh, with some people, actually some people with nothing to do, would link Jose Rizal to Jack the Ripper. You know, some will say well, they, Jack the Ripper was Jose Rizal, Jack the Ripper was a relative of Jose Rizal, and it uh, started to sound very, very quite ridiculous. So I had to research doing the old-fashioned way, looking through a library. And in doing old-fashioned research, I discovered another historical trivia. This time, related to a historical figure who arrived in London in September 1888, four months after Rizal to study law. Unlike Rizal, it was the first time for this young man from India to arrive in a European metropolis. But like Rizal, this Indian became a nationalist and fought the British colonial empire to free his native land. His name was Mohandas Gandhi. Even in Rizal's time, London at the turn of the 20th century was considered as the greatest city on earth, one in which the sun never sets. It was that era we call today as the Victorian age, the reign of Queen Victoria, the period when England was the empire of the West. London was described by Gandhi biographer Ramachandra Guha with three words that begin with the letter I. <clears throat> Sorry. It was a great imperial city. When Rizal arrived, the country has just celebrated the golden jubilee of Queen Victoria's reign. London was the heart of an empire that planted its flags on all four corners of the world with colonies in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So you have imperial. It was also an industrial city. London was already a bustling urban center where gridlocking traffic consisted of the horseless carriages and traditional horse-drawn carriages that mingled in the streets. It had a modernizing transportation system of trains that brought thousands of passengers to all points of the country. Manufacturing, which was the result of the Industrial Revolution, created a bustling port area where ships and steamers carried the fruits of the empire, food, drink, spices, herbs, teas and coffees, animal hides, furs, feathers, ivory, gold, silver and other metals, precious stones, timber, cotton, curries, jute, hemp, or just the art. In fact, nearly everything that the planet produced. All of these were unloaded and stored in warehouses along quays to be moved to shops and stores in the city. It was also a city of business where lawyers, bankers, insurance agents, stockbrokers, importers, and exporters of everything under the sun worked, bought, sold, and traded goods, bonds, and stocks of investments not only in Europe, but also in the colony. London had a financial center that was one of the richest in the world during that time. And lastly, London in 1888 was an international city. The empire's reach all over the globe attracted various natives from its colonies as well as people from other countries. Of the estimated 6 million inhabitants living in Greater London, tens of thousands of Germans, Italians, Czechs, Indians, Malaysians, Chinese, Japanese, Africans, West Indians from the Caribbean, Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians, and South Africans were counted as part of the city's population. A historian noted that in London's crowded street, one might hear all the accents of the empire. There were Filipinos in London, as mentioned by Mariano Ponce to Jose Rizal in one of his letters. Most prominent among them was the exiled lawyer Antonio Maria Regidor, whom Rizal had a falling out later. There is one aspect that I wish to include in those three eyes. London was also an intellectual city. However, this feature was not unique to London. Like many of the European colonial powers during that time, the colonization of the countries as well as contact with others because of world trade contributed to the widespread need for knowledge. Library collections were enlarged and placed in various museums and institutions. Among this was the British Library in the British Museum. As an aside, 
The library of the British Museum already had quite a number of Filipiniana books. Many of them were taken from the libraries of the convents and schools and government offices of Manila during the British occupation of the Philippines from 1762 to 1764. The growth of imperial territory also meant the impetus to learn more about these faraway places. Travel accounts, scientific exploration, reports, guidebooks for traveling to these countries all were published. The opening of the Philippines to world trade in the opening, uh, at the start of the 19th century not only brought in traders and merchants but also explorers and scientists. It wasn't long before these foreigners German, French, British, gathered every bit of knowledge that they can from the islands by compiling libraries and collecting artifacts until some of them began to specialize on things about the Philippines, becoming known as Orientalists, or as Rizal would call them, Filipinologists. Interesting also was the fact that these men, like Rizal's friend, Austrian scholar Ferdinand Blumentritt, became knowledgeable about, about the Philippines without, eating, without even setting foot in the islands. It was in this London that Rizal arrived in and began to conduct a study on the Philippines' pre-colonial past and eventually discovered the work that set him on the road of a historical study that changed his reformist ideas. The Philippine reform movement, or what became known in, in Philippine history as the propaganda movement, was initiated by a group of young Filipino students in, in Spain and exiled liberals from the Spanish colony. Exposed to the liberal atmosphere that was changing Spanish politics, these young men realized the problems of the colonial government in the Philippines and wanted reform. Their demand boiled down to two things. Assimilation as a province of Spain, with representation in the Spanish Cortes, and reforms in the governance of the Philippines that included the recognition of basic rights like the freedom of the press. But fulfilling these demands were not simple. The reformists encountered not only political but social barriers. The inferiority of natives of, of the colonies was a commonly accepted fact by the colonial powers. The Philippines was no different. The Spaniards believed that when they arrived in the Philippines, they encountered an uncivilized people whom they proceeded to civilize and Christianize. So, the Spaniards argued, why should Filipinos be assimilated when they are, to use a modern term, facsimile Spaniards? This further inflamed the growing patriotism of the reformists and led to the idea that to counter the Spanish argument, the Filipino must know themselves, their identity. More specifically, it must be asked who were the Filipinos before the Spanish arrived. It meant looking at their pre-colonial past. It meant looking at the original Filipino. It was for this purpose that Rizal began exploring the British Museum and its library armed with a letter of request to use its holdings and a letter of introduction by Rost, he obtained permission to work in the library. And for the next several days, Rizal perused the volumes of early Spanish accounts written by the friar missionaries of the times. He had one objective, to study and possibly write a history of the Philippines that would show that the early Filipinos were already civilized, contrary to what the Spaniards said. Rizal's purpose wasn't new. Historical studies were already being made by his fellow reformists like Isabella de los Reyes and Pedro Paterno. De los Reyes was already publishing articles on Philippine pre-colonial history that he gleaned from contemporary folklore and sources available to him in the Philippines. These articles were later compiled into several books like El Folklore Filipino, published in 1889, and Historia de Ilocos, published in 1890. These works, however, lack adequate scholarship, but was popular because of their propaganda value. Paterno, on the other hand, had the contacts and the resources to access materials in Spain's libraries and archives. 
unfortunately, his books left much to be desired with regards to scholarship. Not only did he exaggerate his information, he embellished them with a lively imagination. Most of his works were dismissed by Rizal and the other reformists as pure fantasies rather than serious scholarship. Uh, Paterno's works, unfortunately, uh, have been used by some historians until today. Uh, it was only like five years ago that I discovered that, that, that a popular hero in Pampanga, in one of the provinces in the Philippines, was in fact an invention of Paterno. The, that man never existed. Unfortunately, it became a, um, it became a, um, a part of the history of Pampanga, but uh, fortunately, they were a bit open-minded you know, to accept you know, that the uh, person mentioned, that they kept mentioning in their history, is in fact a fantasy. Modern scholars recognize the works of Paterno and de los Reyes as the early efforts to show the Filipino identity, but these were not exactly Rizal what had in mind. Both Isabella de los Reyes and Paterno merely proved that the early Filipinos had a culture of their own, debunking the traditional belief of the Spaniards. In fact, Paterno believed that the pre-colonial Filipino had the same culture as the Spaniards had before colonization. So if Spain had a king, the Philippines had a king. If uh, Spain had a prince, prince and princesses, the uh, Filipinos also had prince and princesses. In fact, even Paterno gave himself a title. You know, he called himself Maginoo, which is equal to a uh, pre-colonial Filipino upper class. Much to the amusement and ridicule of his colleagues. For Rizal, the concept of a national identity was to look for the original Filipino. Now, one of the things that was different from De Los Reyes and uh, Paterno was that Rizal wanted to prove that the pre-colonial Filipino, the, the culture of the pre-colonial Filipino was unique. That, was, that it was original, that um, in fact it was something that the Filipinos had that was destroyed by colonization. No. And at the, in the British Museum, he believed that he may found a book that he, can, that he can use to test and prove his idea. Rizal initially wanted Blumentritt to write a history of the Philippines, as the former considered the Austrian scholar an expert on Philippine culture. Um, yeah, that's true, no? that Blum, Blumentritt was an expert, but he was an expert only in Mindanao. However, Rizal admired him uh, quite um, very well that he actually looked up to Blumentritt. In fact, Blumentritt was his inspiration to write the history of the uh, Morga. But Blumentritt turned down the offer, so Rizal decided to do, him, to do it himself. It was to be a formidable task. For we must remember that Rizal never had any educational training on historical research, except for his readings on a wide range of topics on reading materials that he could lay his hands on or which interested him. Rizal came to Spain to study medicine, not philosophy, not history. So the task would be really formidable. He was starting everything from scratch and he started his work by reading whatever sources he could lay his hands on in the, in the library of the British Museum and from the private Filipiniala collections of friends and acquaintances. It was during his research in the British Museum that he came upon an early 17th century work written by a Spanish official, the Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, or Events in the Philippine Islands, <coughs> written by Antonio de Morga, who arrived in 1593 and served in the colony as lieutenant governor before resigning five years later Here is the book of the, the Morga. Today, the book, the front cover of the book is damaged. No, it was, uh, it, it uh, got torn off. No, and, uh, no, it was our fault. No. <laughs> it, it arrived to us with, with that kind of damage already. But it's still very much the same copy, including the inscription, the one that you see on top. I couldn't read the inscription on, on the top of that because it, it apparently has been erased with a pen. No, but it's uh, probably from the library of someone uh, in the Philippines no? uh, during that time. 
he, uh, he resigned five years later to serve as a member of the Audiencia, after which he was transferred to Mexico in 1603. He died in 1636 in Ecuador after he was charged, investigated, and found guilty on corruption charges. It was said that Morga published his book as a defense against the debacle of the Spanish fleet, which he commanded against the Dutch invaders in 1600. Successos consisted of eight chapters, which chronicled the political events of the early governors general during the first decades of the Spanish colonization. But it was chapter eight, entitled An Account of the Philippine Islands, that would be valuable to Rizal. Morga's last chapter consisted of his descriptions and observations of the inhabitants of the Philippines. When Morga arrived in 1593, it was barely two decades after the founding of Manila and the start of the colonization of the Philippines in 1521. This meant that when Morga arrived and during the period he wrote the successos, he still saw and witnessed the pre-Hispanic Filipinos and their way of life. Thus, the book was exactly what Rizal needed for his planned historical work, for it would keep him it could help him reconstruct the life of the early Filipinos as he wrote to Blumentritt. You know, here's the letter that he, part of the letter that he wrote. Morga is an excellent book. It could be said that Morga is a learned modern explorer. He has nothing of the super, superficiality and exaggeration so peculiar to the Spaniards of today. He writes very simply, but in reading him, one must know how to read between the lines because he had been Governor General of the Philippines and later Justice of the Inquisition. Rizal then set out to fulfill his planned project. Instead of writing a history, he would annotate Morga's successors with data that he was gathering from his readings. But first, in order to annotate the book, he had to copy it first by hand. No? Uh, photocopying, and of course, scaling wasn't... Uh, invented still during that time, so he had to copy the entire work um, by hand, and that actually uh, proved to be also a fault that, that happened to him, because when the book was eventually published uh, in, 18, uh, in um, 1889, there were errors in the text, no? because it was basically based on what Rizal uh, copied. No? These errors were later discovered by Wenceslao Retana, when uh, Retana would publish his own annotated version of the uh, uh, successos. It would take him over a month from August to September 1888 to painstakingly copy the entire book after which he proceeded to annotate it. This is one of the interesting aspects of Rizal's history, using the works of other colonial writers to correct or justify the work of another. This, this is nothing new today with the various ideas of historical interpretation. But during Rizal's time, it was innovation in historical studies. Annotating the Morga took him the better part of a year, and by 1889, it was ready to be printed. In May of that year, he asked Blumentritt if he can write the prologue and to write it with complete freedom and to express his comments and ideas about the new work. Blumentritt agreed. Rizal's project on the Morga almost ended with a sour note. The publication of the book was supposed to be financed by his friends, Antonio Maria Rehidor. However, for unknown reasons, Rehidor backed out at the last minute. This led to a falling out between the two friends. Seeing that he has to publish the book himself, Rizal went around London to look for a printer. But though there were... Though but though there were many printing shops in the city, the price they charged to publish the book was too expensive for Rizal. He decided to have the book printed where it was cheaper, you know, in Paris. And in September 1889, the first copies of the reprinted Antonio de Morga, Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, with the annotation, annotations by Jose Rizal, rolled off the presses of the Libreria de Garnier Hermanos. Well, what was surprising is that 
In September 1889, the, the uh, first issues started coming out. In October, and the exact date was October 1889, the British Museum got its copy. It was a gift from Jose Rizal. You can still see the book there today. Unfortunately, we could never see the dedication that was um, written by Jose Rizal, but because uh, uh, the front page, the, the frontispiece got damaged, and uh, you can only see the, the signature of Rizal and the date, October 5, 18, uh, 1889. No, but apparently, he gave the book uh, during the first months that he was, trying, he was already uh, selling it. The book was a resounding success. Even though he criticized the book in, in the prologue for being too anti-Catholic and that Rizal's comments relied on hindsight, uh, on hindsight Blumenthal told his friend, that the annotations were scholarly. In May 1890, Rizal told Blumentritt that his book is very much sought and read. But misfortune soon hit the morga. Like the Noli, the morga initially was circulated in the Philippines. And like the Noli, it soon caught the attention of the authorities. It seems that anything now written by Jose Rizal was considered taboo to the Spanish colonial, uh, Spanish colonial government in the Philippines, and it was soon banned. His friend, Manuel Arias Rodriguez, wrote to Rizal in February 1890, less than several months after the publication of the book, saying that there was already some difficulty in getting the cargo of books passed through customs in Manila, for it seems that there was already a censorship ban on it. His only option, he told Rizal, might be to send the books from Manila back to Hong Kong and have them shipped to the Philippines again in individual packages instead of one big bulk. Although Rizal did not mention how many copies he had printed for its first run, he wrote to Blumentritt more than a year later that he already sold the last bound copy that was with him. The publication of the Sucesos began Rizal's venture in historical studies that led him to discover and redefine the original Filipino. In fact, some, his, some uh, Rizal scholars and some historians considered his history or the historical annotations as a history written with a Filipino point of view. In fact, in Rizal's la later writings after the publication of the Morga, he started to use history as a means to fight the colonialism in his country and the racist attitudes of Spanish writers. For example, Rizal confidently quoted historical sources in arguing against Vicente Barantes' articles on the Tagalog Theater that came out in 1889. That same year, he published two articles in Trubner's Record, a journal of Asian studies published by Dr. Ross. The first was a list of Tagalog pro uh, pro proverbs, specimens of Tagalog folklore, and the second was a narration of two Eastern fables, one, in which, one, in, one of which was the story that he would introduce to readers, which was the famous The Monkey and the Tortoise. Rizal also published two historical commentaries on Mayi, the Philippine description, the Philippines description by pre-colonial Chinese traders, and the land of Tawalisi, of course, that there, there's a doubt of what, is, uh, what, what and where is Tawalisi now, mentioned by the Arab traveler Ibn Batuta. Two of his most popular writings were a series of articles that appeared in the reformist newspaper, The La Solidaridad. These were Filipinos Dentro de Cien Años, The Philippines a Century Within, in 1889, and Sobre la Indolencia, de los Filipinos, on the indolence of the Filipinos in 1890. If you have read, if you, I'm sure that a lot of you have read these essays, you would see here a lot of quotations by Rizal using historical sources. Actually, he also used some of it in the letter of the women of Malolos, no? but uh, at that time he was still in the middle of a study, studying the uh, sources. So what came out in the uh, letter of the women, to the women of Malolos was a bit uh, limited with regards to its uh, history. The successes today. Admittedly, Rizal's historiography will not pass the scrutiny of modern historians today. 
Like any other historical work, it can become obsolete as new information comes out in the course of historical research. Uh, an example of this study was made by Ambeto Campo no, in his uh, work on um, the one mentioned by Ambassador Lagdemey on the, the one on rotten fish. No? Much of the data that was um, mentioned by Rizal in the uh, Morga, it was in fact uh, already uh, corrected or um, new information had already come out. But in his time, the influence of using history for determining a national identity had remained unsurpassed. How did it influence the, the, uh, the creation of a national identity? One should only look at the history of the Philippine Revolution, where a neophyte being recruited to Bonifacio's Katipunan is asked, Ano ang kalagayan ng mga Pilipino bago dumating ang mga Kastila? What were the conditions of the Filipinos before the Spanish came? And to make a comparison, the second question would be, Ano ang kalagayan nila ngayon? What are his conditions today? This was history, a history introduced by Rizal in his writings that formed those questions. But what was probably the greatest contribution by Rizal to Philippine historiography was the recreation of our country's uh, pre-colonial past. Although, although there were previous works by his fellow reformists on discovering that past, it was Rizal who applied the much-needed scholarship to this history. He also used his annotations to debunk many of the statements of the Spanish religious chroniclers that were tinged with bias against his countrymen. And with this work, he succeeded to show to his readers what the Philippine, early Filipinos were, a people with a unique and civilized culture that was destroyed by Spanish colonization. Lastly, Rizal's annotation to the successors completed the second stage of his plan in writing about the conditions of his country and its history. Remember his words in the opening paragraph of the essay, The Philippines a Century Within. In order to know the destiny of a nation, it is necessary to open the book of its past. As he mentioned in his introduction to the Morga, in the Noli, I began the sketch of the present state of our motherland. In the Morga, he presented the Filipinos' rich past before the Spanish colonizers came. And in his coming novel, this El Filibusterismo, he would show his countrymen the direction that the future of the motherland should take. It brought about the realization of our identity and the creation of the Filipino nation. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.